Let's first start by picking a mud. You have to choose a mud that's appropriate for your skill level and your time constraints. So we have 90 minute mud, right? And in this case, I have 20 minute mud. Now for those of you who do this, sometimes, did you know that if you read the package, on these bags, they tell you two things. One, don't retemper the material. I'll explain that. And secondly, they'll tell you, don't do what I'm gonna do in this video. They tell you don't mix 20 and 90. So if you read the directions, you'll discover those instructions. Not to mix 20, 90, and five together because each of them has catalysts that work toward a, spe a specific time. So I don't see any problem with it as long as you get the mud on and you accomplish the task that you desire, which is to put a nice skim coat on the wall. Retempering is when the stuff hardens up on you and the catalysts have done their job and then you come in and you re-wet it and try to break it up. That's a no-no. You may get problems with bubbles and other issues so i would i would abide by that instruction not to retemper it meaning when it gets solid just make a new batch okay so I'm mixing what was left in my 20 minute bag. If you keep these bags on your truck after they've been opened, when you store them half full for like two, three months, you'll see that the moisture gets in there and kind of wreaks havoc on the material. So I'm just using my inventory and I'm going to put about double what I've put in there already. So I'm gonna mix my bucket. My mixture will be half 20 and half 90. Okay, and I'll be here to tell you the results of it so that you can see that it's, you can do it. So I've added my 90 into my 20. Just gonna break up the clumps down there. So we're almost ready with our mixture. I'll just show you how it is, what its consistency is like. What does that remind you of? Can we call it a yogurt-like consistency? Okay. Give or take a little bit, that's what you want. Okay, so I have a hawk and that'll be the instrument that I used to draw the mud from. A six inch taping knife right there to get into the corners. I also have my 10 inch Marshalltown. Okay, and that is what I'm going to use along the edges of the wall. And the boat trowel, B-O-A-T, boat trowel. That's what they call it in some areas. And so, one of the folks from the UK uh, wanted to purchase one, and that's not what they call it elsewhere. Even in the USA, they don't call it a boat trowel everywhere. So it's a Marshall Town as well. Good tools. And that's another tool. I keep a water bottle so that I can keep the mixture moist on the wall if need be. Okay, let's get to it. What happens when you clean off your tools and you go for the second coat and you wipe all of the chunks off of your taping knives your hawk and they go into the water and also don't forget about all of the chunks on the side walls of your bucket you're on a beautiful piece of property how do you discard these chunks what would you do with them well let me show you a way 
that I came up with that might help you. See that net? Just dump it into a net. You can get these at your local paint store. Okay. This way, two things. You don't have chunks coming off of your bucket onto your next batch. They will never pulverize, okay? And secondly, your customer won't say, this guy left a bunch of chunks on our grass, okay? You see all of that mess down there? Look. And this way, instead of dumping it onto somebody's grass in the corner of their house, it's right there. And you can take it to your own house and do what you gotta do or dump it in the trash, okay? So what I'm doing in this video is applying the mixture of the compound that you just saw me make outside on the grass. I muted this section of the video because my customer had some copyrighted music playing. And so they're gracious enough to let me video inside of their home. I have to make my videos according to their rules, not mine. All I'm doing is taking my boat trowel it looks like I'm moving quickly, but all I'm doing is spreading it on quick because it's the first coat. It's the first of what would be three coats. By the end of this video, you will see that I put two base coats from wall to wall, top to bottom. And the third coat is a polished coat in which I simply put a very thin layer of compound in most of the areas. So let's proceed with the video. Take a look at how we did. One of the tools I want to recommend if you're working alone is a paint roller. Uh, you can accomplish two things by using a paint roller. First of all, you won't need another person to be helping you on the job. You can actually work alone if you had to. Secondly is, you can mix your mud as thin as you have to if you're inexperienced with it, or if you're fatigued for the day, your arm could hurt you. And so what you would do in that case is simply get yourself a nine inch, left to right, a nine inch roller that has some nap on it. This happens to be an inch and a quarter. You don't need that thick but it'll hold a lot of compound for you. Instead of the thinner ones, three eighths or half inch, you'll be putting it on very thin. This will help you get a lot of compound on the wall and um, it'll allow you to work with very thin mud. The third benefit is this. If you mixed it too soupy, this process will help you dry it out. Why? Well, if you take two or three columns of nine inch dipping it in and putting it on the wall, you expose so much of it to the air, it'll, it'll stiffen up and be more usable, more friendly to your needs than it would be if you just kept applying with the trowel and the 10 inch or six inch knife. Do you know what I mean? Using a roller helps you get it on the wall quickly. It helps you, for those of you who are new at it, it helps you to use thicker mud because this is indifferent to how thick or thin it is. It just dips and rolls on the wall, whatever you, whatever you have. Remember, this is a paint roller. So even if you mix it really super thin, really watery because you only have a mild texture, this is your go-to tool right here. Let me show you what I'm talking about. You see, see how much mud that's holding? This is an excellent way to apply your mud. You can see how much mud that holds. And so 
if you just simply apply it to the wool, like you do paint, you can see how easy it is, right? And if you really want to save your back, just put that roller on a painting pole. You can let it stiffen up on the wall. You've exposed all of that now to the air. And so you can expect that she'll firm up sooner than later. So as I roll my compound onto the wall, I come to areas that need a smaller applicator. And so I have a hot dog roller here. This roller has a half inch nap. Look at how nice and easy it gets into that corner, huh? It's a great idea, right? So roll your compound onto the wall, but make sure it's wet enough and you're applying it thickly enough. Why is that? Because if you put it on too thin, that stuff is gonna dry on you. Don't let that happen to you. Have a water bottle. Keep it on your pocket. It, it hooks right into your pocket. Spritz it down. The only thing that'll dry is the water that you spritz onto your compound. That'll dry. And the compound itself will stay moist. You can use either a taping knife for this application here or a boat crown. Boat crown's easier on your wrist. Check it out. So here we are on day two, perfecting the skim coat. And let me show you what I mean by that. First of all, we have to have a bright light either on our head, in our hand, or a freestanding light. Something that will be when on an angle, completely revealing of all of the faults of your first day skim coat. Let's take a look at our skimp coat. This is from day one. What I'm showing you is something that doesn't look so bad, right? But let's go up to where the light is. Let's see it from the light. So this is why you want a bright light to reveal all of these imperfections that will show especially through thin wallpaper. We happen to be putting up thick vinyl, but still, something like this, obviously that would reveal a major problem. Little things like this, not so much, but you wanna see your imperfections through a bright light. So what I'm doing here is just simply scraping off any burrs or any high mistakes from yesterday. You gotta scrape it first, and I suggest you do it with something wide, at least 10 inch spatula or taping knife. And then the mixture that I'm using, I wet it down. When I closed up for the, for the night the previous day, I hosed down the top of the layer of joint compound. And when I opened it up, it had a lot of water on top. And I dumped some of it out, and I kept some of it. This is a very creamy coat that I'm putting on. What I like about it is, you see the blade I'm using? It's a 10 inch blade. I didn't sand any of this, okay? Just take a good look at what I'm doing. I'm putting it on super thin. What allows me to put it on super thin is that it's really wet. And so it, it spreads really thin, okay? So I'm just filling in the valleys. If you look at joint compound in a way where there's highs and lows, all you're doing on the second day is filling in the lows. That eliminates any need for sanding. Trust me, your customers will love you. simple 
of water. Make it a little easier on your wrist and your forearm. You don't need to sand that. We should aim to apply our substrate, whether you're putting lining paper, I don't use lining paper, put skim coat, you should try your best to render it as flat as possible. And you don't want to be sanding when you perfect wallpaper installations. You want to be able to perfect the preparation of walls. Nobody wants dust. Even if you hang it beautifully, your customer will remember you for the dust you got all over their house. So, up close, this is what I was doing. First of all, you want to flatten the sound as much as possible. That's a lot flatter than it was. Because when you do the second step, you don't want to be pulling any of those rocks into your skim coat. So behind your spatula is at least one finger. I don't use two because you lose something with the wrist. Your wrist is less powerful when you have two fingers extended. So I just use one. It gives me the ability to really come down firmly. Now look at how bumpy and everything else it was to, to this. Look at this. How do you like that? Let's do it again. How's that? Let's do it again. That's how you want to do your skim coat. So this is our last and final coat, which is called the polish coat, where we tool, T-O-O-L, as you saw me scraping off the ridges so we tool that, and then I went over it with a super thin layer of joint compound, which I think you would agree does not have to be sanded. Now, why on some videos do I say to wet sand it? And on this video, I'm saying we're not going to sand it. Some of the folks who follow my channel point out some parent discrepancies. Let me tell you, the texture here was very bumpy, more bumpy than what you're looking at. Okay? It was a lot worse than that in certain areas. And I had to go thick, and once you go thick over these bumps, this is what your, picture your tires going over bumps, like that. Well, my blade was doing this too, and it made a lot of ripples, which manifested in, you see those lines this way? Those were ripples in the corner, and the dark spots are my tool coat or my polish coat pulling this way, filling those little valleys in. So, when your skim coat, when your second coat is thin, and practically flat. Then you can come around with a spray bottle and a sponge sander, a little, a little sander that fits in your hand. You know, they're sponges, you wet them, and then you go around and literally here, there, here, 
But in this case, since the second coat still revealed significant bumps, we have to switch our technique and instead of voiding, now let's understand what we're doing when we sand. We're voiding the surface. What do I mean by that? When you sand, you're sanding bumps. Think of it like mountains. When you sand, you flatten them out. In this case, there were so many mountains and so many valleys, I decided to fill them in. You see, that's the equivalent of sanding. What we're doing when we're adding compound, and that's why compound is called compound, because you're adding layer to layer in order to make it flat, isn't that right? Joint compound, when you add layer on top of layer on top of layer, you eventually have a flat surface. There's two ways to get a flat surface. Number one, you can sand out the mountains. Or number two, you can fill in the valleys. Do you understand that? You see those dark lines? Those were ridges on my second coat. And they're dark because they're valleys. They're filled in, they're wet. This was the high point, this was the low. And we filled it in, and that's why it's wet and dark. Now, theoretically, I could have sanded this this way and brought it down to the valley, am I not right? Yes, I'm right, but you know what? I would have voided so much of the surface that I would have revealed the peaks of the texture. Once again, when you are looking to flatten out your surface, there's two ways to do it. You either sand it down or you fill in the valleys. This is clearly the way to go because we avoid the mess that would result from sanding it out. And now, this is uniformly white, right? For the most part. And we anticipate this within the next half hour with the help of our fan to be completely white. And then we're going to take our famous weld bond mixture, which is one part weld bond, two parts water, and put a membrane on the surface in order to seal this skim coat. We need to seal it. Why is that? Despite the fact that I did a really good job of making it flat, it's a porous surface. If you look really close, you will see an endless amount of pores. And what do those pores do? They will suck that glue in. And when you go to remove your wallpaper down the road, you will pull off the wall with it. So we put a seal coat on it, a membrane, that will be between our wallpaper and this substrate, so that when they want to take it down, it just comes down and leaves this up. And it's the equivalent of guards, G-A-R-D-Z. Guards is a popular primer sealer for this type of work extremely popular, a go-to choice for the wallpaper hanging. It's the equivalent of Shields, S-H-I-E-L-D-Z, from Zinser. Zinser also makes guards. They're sister products for wallpaper installers. Shields is not so much available as is guards, but nonetheless, there are literally 10 products on the market that you could use to seal this up. I choose to use the one that isn't so well advertised and therefore costs a lot less money. For $5 now, instead of $45, I'm going to seal these three walls using what is the ingredients of guards, which is glue and water. So let's get to it. Let's let this dry 
and we'll go in and seal it up. I have found that this is far cheaper to use. Why spend 40 to $45 per gallon for guards when this is a product that is glue and water? What is guards? And guards is a lot more expensive. And so I just make my own sealer and I put one part of this into my bucket and two parts water. Okay, let's get to mixing it. And so you'll be mixing it to the consistency of your typical mixture of Roman Pro 999 or guards itself. It's watery, it's white, and of course it dries clear. So now this is our finished seal substrate. <clears throat> I've rolled it on where I could roll and in the corners I use the brush and at the top I use the brush. Just to give you an idea of the thickness of this membrane. That's what I just put on there. You see that? It's literally a very substantial <coughs> membrane <coughs> excuse me between your skim coat and your wallpaper now you understand with seeing how thick this stuff is when applied appropriately with a roller and a brush how much of a protection it is for your substrate this plaster will not be coming off when they pull this wallpaper down. So I'm going to let this dry. I'm going to give it at least one full hour with the fan blowing on it. And then we'll get to hanging our beautiful nautical mural. And so I want to show you how thick you want to put your glue. A lot of the questions that I get on my YouTube channel have to do with the results of not having applied sufficient glue. Okay, this is the amount of glue that you want on the back of your wall covering. Let me put my finger in it to show you. You do not want your glue to be this thick no 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 and you don't want it to be this thin this will dry too quickly on you This is just right. This is too thick. And this is way too thin. Too thin. Too thick, just right. Without creasing the fold, we let this product book for 10 minutes. And what is it doing when it's booking? 
What's happening here? Now I want everybody to think. What do I want you to think about? Who has ever used a brand new mop? The white or the blue uh, cotton mop. You get yourself a five gallon bucket of water. You stick the mop in, what happens? What happens to the mop? Come on, all of you know. It's the same thing that's happening right here and right now. You introduce water to the fabric. You pull it out. Most of the cotton isn't wet. Why is that? Because the moisture in your bucket has not absorbed into the cotton mop. And the moisture in your glue has to be absorbed into the backing of your wall covering. Go back to the mop. Stick the mop in the water. What do you see? Bubbles. Why is that? There's oxygen in your mop. It's in the very fibers. When you squeeze it and it compresses, what are you pushing out? You're displacing oxygen, air. If you do not let this book sufficiently, let's not call it booking. Let's call it, I'm letting it absorb. Then you'll understand more easily what's going on here. They call it booking, but it's a process of absorption. The cotton, or the backing of your wall covering, is resisting the moisture in your glue. And what you can't see right now are the bubbles dissipating from your wall covering right now. That's what's happening. The oxygen is being displaced on the backing of your wall covering during the absorption or booking process. If you should fail to sufficiently book or permit your wall covering to absorb, you will have an overabundance of bubbles. An overabundance of bubbles. So much so that they might be insurmountable after the installation. Very important that you understand what's taking place when you book your wall covering. If you have a thick vinyl, give it 10 minutes, unless the wall covering says to give it more. Okay, those backings that support type two vinyl, that heavy commercial vinyl is very, thick and you have to let it absorb the moisture in the glue so that it can displace the air and be filled with with the moisture of the glue so that they become one in this process just as the process of the mop in the bucket we're displacing air and filling the fibers of the fabric with moisture. Any air that remains are called paste bubbles and they manifest in little dime size or quarter size coins, no bigger than your thumb. And you'll go to push them out and they'll just travel upward or downward or sideward, leave them alone. Your glue is congealing and the more you press on your glue, the more chance you take of risking a permanent depression in not only your wall covering, but of the congealed glue underneath. If the bubble just keeps moving left, right, up and down, leave it alone. I am not talking about a hand size air pocket. You must get that out. But you will see, you have no bubbles at four o'clock and then at five o'clock you have bubbles. 
the oxygen is releasing from the vacuum and it manifests itself in trapped air because your wall coverings up. But you can't see it taking place right now, but it is. And that's what we call booking, otherwise known as absorption, air displacement, whatever you want to call it, but that's what's happening right here. Okay, let's hang this thing. What I have here is something very similar to saran wrap. What I'm doing is putting it under my seam, right there. That's where my seam is going to be. Why am I putting plastic there? If you have ever double cut wallpaper, you know that there is a chance of the plaster or joint compound coming up with the piece that is called the overlap or the underlap. For those of you who are not familiar with what I'm speaking about, when you do a double cut, you overlap the two seams and then you slice in the middle. You come up with two pieces of scrap. One is called the overlap and one is called the underlap. For those of us who do this for a living, we know that sometimes under certain conditions, the piece touching the wall tends to pull the joint compound with it. But I'm doing something with this plastic, which is similar to wrapping a sandwich. I'm keeping the moisture against the wallpaper and I'm keeping the, I'm preventing it from attaching to the wall. And guess what? It worked out perfectly. So here is my first sheet. It's 54 inch wall covering. This product is extremely good material. Please see the link in the video. And there is my plastic. And it's preventing the glue on the wall covering from removing the plaster underneath it. So after we get this piece up, we now realize that this piece has been relaxing for a while but not against our substrate. Now we can remove the protective plastic because we don't need it anymore. And what is it acted like? A sandwich bag on your bread and meat. And now you see our substrate is completely intact, okay? That's important. You know that if you left this sitting up against here for 10 minutes while this piece booked, you run the risk of pulling this up. Don't let it happen to you. After I removed this plastic, I put my wallpaper together at the seam. You see it overlapping there? And so I overlapped what's on the left over what's on the right, and I did what's called a double cut. You've seen this in my videos before. The point of this part of the video is to show you good folks that sometimes your substrate comes off with the underlap piece. You know it and I know it. I'm just showing you a different way that I came up with it to prevent the recently applied joint compound from coming off with your underlap. It's happened to me. I know it's happened to some of you. In fact, one of my buddies on YouTube from Michigan has told me how he prevents that from happening because it has happened to him as well. And so I share this trick with you so that you too can prevent that from happening to you. Now for the do-it-yourselfer, um, if you're going to attempt a double cut, please, it's a good idea to use the plastic barrier because you'll probably take a long time to make your double cut and I don't want your wallpaper pulling off your recently applied skim coat. So it's a good idea. I don't always use it, but I used it in this installation because I was working alone. So... 
Unfortunately, since I was working alone, I couldn't videotape all of my double cuts, but I'm going to show you where they are with my hand. There's one of my seams. Um, this product I highly recommend. It's extremely well made. It doesn't tear. It's thick vinyl. The color does not come off at all. This mural was a product that retailed for $1,800 by the customer. He will be sending me pictures of the real-life anchor that he will be attaching to this wall in a few days, and I will attach it to my Instagram account, meaning that I will show the finished photos of this homeowner who's going to make this wall look absolutely beautiful. He actually has a real life anchor that he'll be attaching to this side of the wall. And he has some other really cool ornaments that will be going on the wall as well. I'll probably be posting pictures of it on my Instagram channel as well.